Hello everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, September 27th, 2013. Today, we have a bundle of very interesting stories, including an update, of course, on Comet Ison. Uh, what else do we talk about <laughs> around here? Uh, a cool history story about the Buran, that's the, uh, the Soviet space shuttle. Uh, water on Mars, again. Uh, an asteroid that is actually space junk. Uh, new plans for Spitzer, a split personality pulsar, uh, Soyuz launch, a, uh, and the apex image of the cat's paw nebula. And joining me this week, our intrepid team of space journalists, we've got Amy Shira Title. Hello. David Dickinson. Hey. Jason Major. Hey there. Nicole Gallucci. Hello. She's just rocking. Are you rocking out, Nicole? So the, there's music playing in, in the office, so yeah, I'm dancing right. to it. It's All not right. just in my head this time, I promise. <laughs> She's a radio astronomer. So. <laughs> and Scott Lewis. Hey, Scott. Hey, everyone. Uh, first, Scott, you, your backyard is on fire. It, oh, no. It's smoldering, yeah. I was, yeah, I was, I was a Tuesday? No. Yeah, Tuesday. Monday or Tuesday. It went up on fire. Like crazy hot, I went outside and the foothills all on fire. Grabbed my camera, took a bunch of video, photo, sold it to NBC, and was on the news. But yeah, it's it's crazy. It was it's really intense because I, mean, I used to be a firefighter. I used to leave the fire ground away and come home. I don't like it when it's coming towards my home. <laughs> <laughs> when your work comes home with you. Yeah, that's that's not good. But yeah. uh, so far, there's been no injuries or deaths. Uh, reported, which is really, really good. Um, last report was 250 acres went up. Wow. Man, what a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, you get some nice sunsets, though, right? I'm sorry? You'll get some nice sunsets? Oh, sunsets? That's true. Yeah. Hazy orange, yeah. Yeah, nice hazy orange, beautiful red sun. Yeah, I, I love the, having the, the, the ash all over my car. That was great. Right. Yeah. <gasps> all right, so uh, space news. I think, uh, well, I want to start with what I think was one of the best pieces of space writing uh, this week, and that is the uh, this amazing write-up on the Buran uh, Soviet space shuttle. And, Amy, you did this article over on Ars Technica, and you're always loath to give us your history stories, but this was terrific. So, so uh, yeah, as we say, Thank be you. loud and proud. What's the, what's the story about the Buran? And I'll try and dig up... Nicole and I will um, try and dig up some pictures here. While, yeah, while we can find images because I'm, I'm never good at the screen sharing. But, yeah, no, um, you just talk. Just focus on the talk. <laughs> the, I can do that. Um, so the Buran space shuttle is the Soviet space shuttle that I think I think almost everyone's seen a picture of it and the immediate knee-jerk reaction is, well, hmm, well, gosh darn, doesn't that just look exactly like our space shuttle, our being NASA's? Um, and, you know, that's that's a very logical reaction because it's, it's the exact same shape. It's almost the same size. It's almost identical. Um, the launch vehicle, the Energia launch vehicle, is of course not quite the same as the sort of main tank with the two external boosters, but it is a main tank that's almost identical to the shuttles with four external boosters. Um, so, so I kind of dug into the story of Buran in this massive article over at Ars Technica, and, and what I found in researching this was that the story is so much more than just like, oh, they they're building a space shuttle, so let's copy it. Um, so NASA decided to build the space shuttle. Actually, President Reagan, or sorry, Nixon, decided to build the space shuttle in 1972. There were sort of a whole bunch of different things that NASA was looking at doing in its post-Apollo days. Um, and one of those post-Apollo options was building an orbital space station, and that plan included a shuttle that would you know, shuttle astronauts back and forth between Earth and low Earth orbit. Um, however, Nixon okayed the shuttle, but not the space station, which is why we ended up with the shuttle doing nothing in Earth orbit. Um, but, but as the shuttle developed, there were all kinds of considerations that the Department of Defense wanted, because NASA was looking for a way to make space flight more affordable, and um, the idea was to have about 50 launches per year, and that would include military launches. And the Department of Defense said, okay, well, if you make your payload bay this size, which I think, I don't have the number off the top of my head, I think it's like 60 feet long and 15 feet wide or something, but the, the size of the payload bay of the shuttle was dictated by the Department of Defense because they wanted to be able to launch military shuttles. The, the other things, um, there was a launch facility to be built at... Um, Oh, golly, which Air Force Base was it? It was Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, and 
the shuttle had to have a 2,000 kilometer cross range capability, which was um, had to do with certain missions of sort of going up into a polar orbit and coming down and being able to sort of get back in in one orbit. And it, it all looked really suspect to the Soviets um, because NASA had, you know, there was no more Cold War space race, sort of. <laughs> um, so everything was public. So as NASA is developing this, this space shuttle, the Soviets are looking at it and thinking, okay, well, what are they possibly needing a vehicle this big for? They, they kind of did some calculations and realized, like, okay, if this, this thing can lift, like, 30 tons into orbit 50 times a year, they're definitely building something that's going to be that big. And they thought, you know, laser weapons. Um, so the Soviet decision actually came four years after NASA started building the shuttle. Um, and, and the Soviets basically said, we don't know what they're doing with this spacecraft, so we're just going to build the same thing and have the same capabilities for whatever we need it for. So they basically copied the space shuttle. Now, it's not entirely like identical. Um, the big difference, the sort of most obvious difference, is that the Boron shuttle doesn't have a main engine, whereas the space shuttle does. Um, it's also got some different avionics and, and systems. Uh, Boron was also designed to fly unmanned missions as well as manned missions. Um, but, I mean, they, they really do look the same. <laughs> they really do kind of function the same. Um, Boron never got, I mean, it was a political mess, because why, why build a spacecraft that's this massive? When you've already got, they had the, um, the Salyut space station going at the time, and the Soyuz program already going on at this time, and the Mir space station was already underway at the time. Boron only flew once, and the energy launch vehicle that launched it only flew twice. The other time was with the Polyus Skiff um, laser article testing ground thing, which is another super sketchy, fun story. Um, so Buran only flew once in November of November 15th, 1988. It flew around the Earth twice and returned, three times and returned. Um, it was unmanned, and it never flew again. It just never, there was never a need for the Soviet Union to, to keep this thing around as long as NASA kept its around. Um, but it was sort of, I mean... Like, it's just this great story of Cold War paranoia forcing the Soviet Union to develop something completely unnecessary because, well, they're doing it. We should probably match that. Worst justification for a space program ever. It's so <laughs> weird. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They well, must it, be building lasers in space. Yeah. We need to build lasers, too. We, we don't know what lasers. they're building, but let's build something with the same kind of capability to yeah. carry stuff into space. And once we once that laser is deployed, we'll put a space laser on <laughs> ours, too. Yeah. Well, if Tommy down the street build a space shuttle, does that mean you have to build one, too? <laughs> yeah. If you, if you look for every... every Everything from that era, like the the B one bomber and the backfire bomber and the F fifteen and the in MiG twenty five, they were all we, the the technology was all being it was very like we were following what they were doing. They were following what we were doing basically. Right. Yeah, well, we didn't want to have a space of... laser gap, so <laughs> they yeah, had. I think somebody they had fun... pointed out in the in the um in a comment somewhere. I can't remember if they emailed me, but sort of the the good idea that you know in the same way we had the fake missile gap. There's apparently a fake space shuttle gap and a fake space gap and all these, like, it's just this great sort of ongoing non-gaps where everyone's just trying to match each other for no apparent reason. It's like the, the men who stare at goats where they, they were studying remote viewing with psychics, so we figured there might be something to it, so we better take a look at it. <laughs> we should have a, a sequel to yep. Doctor Strange Love with this. <laughs> I think so. Or How to Love the Shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one thing, just to let people know, uh, the new comet track, you've got this nice new uh, thing at the bottom here, our lower third, but the actual way to com track comets is we're having a lot of trouble tracking yeah. comets. So you can't do hashtags, you can't do anything. You can't do hashtags, you can't do searches, you can't do all kinds of stuff. So I don't know, where do we want? We want people to go to YouTube now to uh, talk? Yeah, I think the YouTube comments are in the comment tracker, um, so I know you're watching that. I'm not I seeing them. You're not they're seeing not, them? No, they're not in my comment tracker. You got Did you add? Because I have no way of sharing the sources anymore. So yeah. So you just have to add add the YouTube URL. Um, but those will show up sort of. In comment oh, tracker. that's not done automatically anymore. It's not done automatically <laughs> I'm anymore. You nothing. still have to do it. Yeah. So I, I I'm seeing a couple of comments. Um, X Man 049 uh, wanted to add a related story, which I don't think was in our list. The Laddie spacecraft on its way to the moon just passed Apogee, so its closest point to Earth before it heads mm. out. I think it's taken a month to get out to the moon and study the moon's uh, dust and exosphere environment. Oh, hold on, let me just do this. Sure. 
Oh, mm-hmm. hey. Check it out, check it out. Wow. Yeah, cool. there you go. If only yeah, right. we could actually get our, all our comment sources, that would be perfect. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. <laughs> right. uh, oh, well. Okay. But I, I'm watching the event page since that's where I, I post links in real time, so... Laddie's yeah. actually doing three elongated orbits like that before he heads oh, out okay. to the moon. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, another one coming by it. is uh, Juno here pretty soon, as Juno's going to be flying by, too. Next month, yeah. Next next week, I think oh. October fifth. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, okay. Well, anyway, so so that was a nice short version, Amy. You should definitely check out her article. It's over on Ars Technica. If you just do a search for Braun, you'll dig it up. Uh, let's move on to the continuous coverage, our ongoing coverage <laughs> of Comet Ison. Will it be the comet of the century, or will it just vaporize will it and disappear? Be you know, will it be Will it be like Comet Kohotek too? I, I was. Too. I was thinking this week, writing about it, you know, after writing about ice and conspiracies and whatnot, now I actually get to write about ice and observing in science and the cool stuff about the astronomy about ice and about where you're actually going to be able to see it. Yeah. Uh, this Right now, the comet is about a magnitude fainter than it should be, but I don't really think that's really a cause for concern. It's about 11th magnitude right now. I think by the first week of October, we should break 10th magnitude. I haven't actually seen it. I haven't actually been able to get out. Of course, we've got rain here, and we've had a very bad summer. But I have not actually seen Ison for myself through the telescope yet. Once it reaches 10th magnitude, it should be fairly visible through uh, binoculars and telescopes. And I think probably mid-October I'll be getting my first view. Also, what's cool is the moon is moving out of the sky. The moon is going to be heading toward new phase. The comet Ison is in the morning sky right now. It just crossed over into the constellation Leo. And it's going to be moving through Leo, then down through Virgo, and it's going to be reaching perihelion uh, November 28th at 1.1 kilometers from the sun, from the surface of the sun. So it's going to be pretty close. Not as close as Lovejoy was, but somebody pointed out earlier this week when I was researching this article about what Ison is doing blow by blow, date by date, that... Uh, Lovejoy, the comet Lovejoy from a few years ago that made its bright appearance after it came by the sun, was much fainter when it was at this distance right now than comet Ison is. So there's still some hope, I think, that Ison's going to perform. It all be- depends on what it does past perihelion. It's going to be passing some bright stars, too. It's going to be passing uh, Spica. It's going to be passing uh, Beta Virginis. It's going to be passing toward a group of galaxies in Leo. I believe it's on... October October 26th, it's going to be passing toward a triple uh, group of galaxies. That's going to be a good photo op. There's also another comet that may enter into the picture, uh, Comet Enki, is going to be right around November 23rd. This is a short period comet on a three-year orbit. You'll probably see some uh, astrophotographers getting images of Comet Enki, and the planet Mercury and Saturn will be up in the sky right a few about or four days prior to perihelion. It's going to make a good grouping low to the east. And Comet Ison is going to be a morning object when it comes back around the sun in perihelion, too. It's not going to become a circumpolar object visible in the dusk sky uh, until later in December, right around Christmas time. It's going to be moving northward up through Polaris and up through those constellations, uh, Ursa Major and constellations like that. Well, so, don't forget about being visible during the day. They it's talk about that. I well, it's going to be really close to the sun. I think you're going to have to be able to block the sun out physically, like with a building or something like that, in order to see it. Because unfortunately, when it reaches that brightest point, it's going to be very close to the sun. So but I think only probably the most skilled skilled astrophot. Now, something that's interesting, I was talking to uh, Michael Zeiler over at Eclipse Maps. There is a hybrid eclipse, an annular total, that crosses the Atlantic in in Africa in November on November third. Well-placed viewers might be able to see Ison if it's bright enough during the eclipse at that time. Now, the eclipse has got a very narrow window. Unfortunately, the totality, once it reaches totality, is going to be like less than a minute. So he was pointing out, I don't know how many people would journey to Africa to see a total solar eclipse that only lasts 40 seconds and then go look for a comet next to it. But if, it's, if it gets brighter than, it, than expected... They, I bet somebody might be able to do a wide field shot of uh, the corona in the eclipse sun and Comet, I- Comet Ison's about 50 degrees from the sun. So it's going to be a ways. I suspect it's going to be either somebody in the mid-Atlantic on a ship or there are also some flights going out of Bermuda that are going to observe. There's some amateur groups that are going to actually fly on a charter jet and try to observe the eclipse. 
at the same time. They might be able to get images too. But that's I bet there'll be some easy. good images coming up out of, out of there. I mean, you know, you, you talk about you know who's going to go do this. There's there's always you know there's always a handful of people that are just dedicated and have the time and 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 resources to go be able to do these types of things and get amazing yeah. images. So it's going to sound pretty exciting. Uh, Mike, Michael Lewis Hill Zucker. thinks. Uh, sorry, no, Lewis Hill thinks no. we need a jingle for breaking ice and news. So <laughs> we should. That was ding, in ding, my ding, head ding. as as you guys said ding, that. Ding, ding, so ding, yeah. Ding, yeah, ding, yeah, ding, yeah, exactly. Ding, ding, Comment ding, ding, of the century. No. <laughs> we. We've been getting a fair amount of good amateur images too on that post. I, I had a, a lot that we could use out of the Universe Today Flickr group, and there there are some dedicated amateurs with telescopes much bigger than mine that have been able to get after it and get some images. Well, uh, and Hubble's still Hubble's going to be covering it as well. Hubble's going to be imaging it. It's yeah. it's passing Mars on October first, so we may see probably next week we'll be talking about whether or not uh, M MRO with high rise and the Curiosity rover probably will have tried to image it, which will be the first time we've imaged a comet from the surface of another planet, which will be Which cool. will be awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's freaking amazing. Story idea, if anybody wants to, that's probably coming up. Um, yeah, you should, you, it, it's all you. Uh, all right, so let's move on. Actually, this is great. So apparently, this just in, there's water on Mars. What? <laughs> and I've also heard that Voyager has left the solar system. <laughs> but no, for real these this time. No, it's not left the solar I system. For real these. For real these and now. That's that's the thing. All right. So Scott, what is this what is this nonsense story about water on Mars? And, you know, there's water on Mars. Um well, as many of actually us that are in this hangout now, um, where we were there for the landing of Curiosity last year in August. And one of the instruments on there is SAM. Which is the um, <clears throat> which is the sample analysis at Mars, and it's you know been going through doing its test driving, and it did also um, some tests at this really neat location called Rock Nest. So it was going through some samples, and what I love too is that the the quote pulled from this discovery article by our good friend Ian O'Neill, um, the quote by Lori says one of the most exciting results from this very first solid sample ingested by Curiosity. Because, you know, Curiosity is thing, eating stuff. It also poops. Was, and it poops. Yep. So I think that's awesome. But what it was going through when it was doing the analysis through SAM is that it was able to pull out, um, you know, doing the analysis, it was able to pull out that there's oxygen available um, in this analysis here, but also signs of... Um, of perchlorates and carbonates, which carbonates, um, the carbonate materials, they only form in the presence of water. So they're saying here with this analysis coming out that around 2% um, of the soil that they were sampling there had water in it. So instead of just guessing or, you know, we assume that there was water at some time or finding different evidences that they were able to actually find chemical analyses of you know finding these um, carbonates that must form in the form of uh, with the presence of water there. So when future Mars travelers go there, they they just know they can calculate exactly how much regolith they'll need to grind down to to drink their liquid. Right. So you you're gonna go there, dig a ditch, sweat it all out, and then heat it up and get the water out, and then you're fine. Yeah, you know, something easy. Um, so, I mean, you know, put this into perspective. Amy, I know you're working on this story as well. I mean, the larger perspective here is they're trying to really understand the conditions on Mars. Is, you know, is it available for life, not looking for life itself, so. Yeah. Um, well, what what I've seen, and, and I'm sorry, I'm still working on the article, but um, the, the water that they found or the evidence of water they found is actually 2% by weight. I'm not totally sure what that means and whether or not that has any impact on how much and how easy it would be to get out, but it's still not as nearly the amount that is in sort of locked under the surface in ice form. So I don't, I don't really know. I mean, if astronauts were to go there, would it be worth trying to siphon out this very small amount of water from soil? I forget. Um, I saw somewhere a great you know how much water you would need for, or how much soil you would need for a pint of water. I'm trying to find that, um, but you know it might it might be might make a lot more sense to send astronauts with the tools that they would need to dig into that ice where there's significantly more water um, or ice that could be made into water. So 
Yeah. yeah I, don't, I, 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 I can't really good. say what this would mean for future astronauts, but it is really cool. <laughs> I'm, um, wondering, I'm wondering if, 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 it, if there are going to be different concentrations of water depending on the type of uh, soil that they see across different regions of Mars. So they sample, for example, um, the soil that's in Gale Crater. Uh, maybe it's you know maybe it's looser, maybe it's sandier. Uh, what happens if they go somewhere where there's there's uh, a, a denser soil that has smaller pores in it, like clays and things like that? You know, will it have a higher concentration of water in there? I know they I know they did say that you know the samples that they took are supposedly indicative of you know perhaps a wider area across the entire planet because it's wind blown. So you know because it's just in that top layer. So this is what's getting blown around. Um, you know, you just have to wonder what about different types of materials. Maybe they hold more water. Uh, maybe they're more than 2%. Maybe they're 5% or 3% or 10%. Who knows? Right. And, and with the lack of atmosphere there on Mars, anything on the surface is going to be negligible than anything below the surface. Because right. without that, that uh, you know, without the atmosphere there, anything will evaporate away. And so they're just saying that the signs there from the carbonate there show that it formed at some time because there was water present. And that, you know, this particular compound went there. But I definitely would say, you know, keep on digging. You, you might want to bring, uh, you want to dig a well might be the best way. Then would go through and scoop a well. up the sand. And, and, and it would have to move a lot of rock yeah. to get just a, <laughs> a tiny amount of water, like on the moon, too. Wasn't but, there some, I'm, I'm remembering some made-for-TV movie or show or something where they were trying to drill for water on Mars and then the... When the geyser, water geyser happened, it was disastrous because it was all turning into ice and killed one of the astronauts. Wouldn't it Someone in the comments will remember that. <laughs> no, it was like some like first human settler sent to Mars oh, okay. need for TV thing in the mission to Mars genre. But I think it was on Discovery or something. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Uh, so let's talk about uh, Jason. I want to talk about this split personality pulsar. And in Universe Today, I don't know if you saw it, Elizabeth uh, said it was like that it was hulking out. It was like the Hulk. Yeah, I saw Elizabeth's, <laughs> Elizabeth's article there. That was uh, that was great. She likened this. Um, she likened this pulsar, this neutron star, to a uh, to the Hulk. Um, you know, go from uh, uh, Doctor Banner to the Hulk, and that's kind of what's happening here. Um, although another analogy that's been giving is it's kind of like a uh, it's kind of like a a teenager all of a sudden acting like an adult, um, and then you know going back again and then back and forth. Um, what astronomers have found. Uh, in a in a uh, uh, what's I'm I'm trying to think of the right term here. Is it it's a globular cluster or globular cluster? Somebody sure correct me. We know what both are. Yeah. Okay, so the in a globular <laughs> cluster, uh, eighteen thousand light years away towards the center of a galaxy, they found a um, it's a it's a neutron star. It's a bright X-ray source. So what this is, it starts off as what they call a low mass X-ray binary. It's a um, it's a neutron star, and I've got some AV guides here. So you got this neutron star, which is the uh, the the super dense remains of a you know a good sized star, um, bigger than our sun. So you, and it's rapidly spinning, and it has an accretion disk around it, and the accretion disk is coming from its buddy, which is a a low mass you know sun like star. Um, that's nearby, and it's basically slurping off material from this star, and it's going into a disk around the uh, around the neutron star. And that disk gets superheated, and it just starts shooting out X-rays that are detectable by um, you know X-ray observatories like NASA's Chandra, like uh, ESA's uh, X XMM Newton. So they can see this thing, and it's glowing brightly in X-rays. Um, but then what happens is it shuts off. And it starts shooting out uh, uh, radio waves uh, from its poles. It's you know it's spinning, 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 and it's spinning up to 254 times a second. So that rapid rate makes them call it a millisecond pulsar. Um, so switching back and forth has never been seen before. Uh, not in this not in this you know short time span. Basically, they're looking at you know it's doing this every few days or so. Um, so the important thing that's happening here is they're seeing what's kind of a missing link uh, in the evolution between a low mass X-ray binary and that millisecond pulsar. Um, generally, what's the the structure that's going on there is this accretion disk gets blown away 
uh, as as it heats up, and I'm I'm, I'm trying to think of the actual um, the actual uh, uh, process that's going on here. So you've got the secretion disc around the uh, around the the, um, the pulsar, and it's just you know emitting X-rays like crazy. Uh, as the neutron star picks up more material from the disc, it also gets spun up. And the neutron star has a really strong magnetic field. So as it's spinning, as it's spinning, that uh, that magnetic field starts to throw out all of the material that's left in there because the stuff gets that's getting pulled off of the larger low mass star uh, that that you know trickles down. It's not always coming in at a constant rate. So once it gets rid of all this bright X-ray stuff, it's able to uh, uh, shoot out. Basically, the the uh, radio waves from its um from its poles, and as those sweep by our point of view, we see it as a pulsar. So, wh what's really cool is that this hasn't been seen before. So it's kind of like one of these missing link type things. You know, it's uh, uh you know it's a it's a process that's known to take place in the evolution of a neutron star from the X-ray binary to the millisecond pulsar. But that's t that in and of itself takes billions of years. What they've finally seen here with this one is the process taking place and they can see it switch back and forth. So it's kind of like, you know, switches on, switches off. It's it's uh, x-ray binary, low, it's a low mass x-ray binary, it's a millisecond pulsar. So that's the whole kind of idea of how it's, how it's you know, one thing, it's another, it's, you know, David Banner, it's the Hulk, um, you know, just goes back and forth like that. It's a teenager, it's a yeah. adult. Scott Ransom yeah. of the and, National yeah. Radio Astronomy Observatory called it Jekyll and Hyde, but I, Jekyll think, and Hyde, I think he you know, should have adopted Banner and Hulk. <laughs> but really, the, the important thing here is actually seeing the process taking place right in front of us. Um, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like you know what happens when you know you sneak downstairs and see and see mom and dad putting gifts under the Christmas tree. I mean, you're seeing this magical wow, thing happening. Wow! Spoiler alert! Yeah. I hope there aren't any little children watching. Uh, why? What happens when they do that? Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> the yeah, Santa is really a binary star. Yeah, exactly what it's like. A millisecond pulsar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that's how he's able to get to all the. You know, they're going to get gonna to all find the kids. out somewhere. <laughs> I'd rather it be here. I'm with you, but I'm the one who always gets in trouble, so. <laughs> all right, we're moving on. Um, <laughs> the, and the cake is a lie. <laughs> what? The cake is not a lie. Um, all right, so, uh, David, let's talk about an asteroid that is, uh, that is not an asteroid. Yeah, there was an interesting discovery on August 23rd from the PanStar survey. Uh, it's based in Maui and Hawaii of an asteroid that they had tentatively dubbed 2013QW1. Now that kind of discovery wasn't anything unusual per se uh, from what we usually see, but this one was found to be in a very wide-ranging Earth-trailing orbit, and that's not something we generally see an asteroid do. There was an asteroid a few years ago that kind of had the same kind of story as this one, too, uh, that was dubbed J002E3. That was back in 2002. Now, some European researchers decided to analyze this asteroid a little closer using the uh, Galileo telescope out of uh, La Palma, and they actually found that it had a very bright signature, a very bright spectra that was very uncharacteristic of an asteroid, but was characteristic of a painted metal object. And it turns out that this asteroid is actually a Stage 3 booster from the Chang'e 2 mission that China had launched to the moon back in 2009. This, this mission went orbited the moon for about a year. It went out to the uh, Earth's L2 point, and then it went on to pass asteroid Tutatis a few years ago. It was the first mission that actually got close to asteroid Tutatis and got photos of that NEO asteroid. So yeah, is you this can your see drawing here, David. That is that is me and Paint putting on the uh, markers of where the Stage Three booster is. Actually, on the uh, that's a Long March 3C rocket. That is actually the launch of Chang'e 2. I actually dug that up from the Chinese Space Agency. That's actually the that that one's not just a generic launch of a of a Long March C3. Now the asteroid they found back in 2002, that one they found had a spectra of uh, titanium oxide, and they did some researching and they found out that titanium oxide was uh, derivative from the paint from the old Apollo boosters. And what that was was a stage three of a Saturn V rocket, and they actually managed to pin down which mission, the one that they found in 2002 that was orbiting the Earth for a time, that came around where they said Earth has a second moon at that time. There was a story, and I actually looked back in the Universe Today archives, 
you wrote about this back in t September 2002 about the same uh, asteroid turns out to be space junk did, story. Did I? Back then. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, way back before we had blogs. been for a while, Fraser. Yeah. I have been doing yeah. this for a I, while. I thought of that right before the show. I was like, I wonder if he has the same story way back when. There, It looked like it's been migrated over from, yeah. from the website. But you actually have written about that same uh, Apollo. It was the, the third stage of Saturn V of Apollo 12 was actually... One of the few boosters, most of the boosters smashed into the moon. They used them to steady uh, seismic experiments that they had left on the moon from Apollo 11. The subsequent boosters, they uh, yeah, and that actually is the launch, the famous Apollo 12 launch that got struck by lightning, and and uh, that's actually the the stage booster that's that's out there. Incidentally, it's not orbiting the Earth anymore. It got kicked out of orbit in 2004, and probably is going to come back around in in 2040, right now. So. Uh, anything that gets put in or orbit around the Earth, the wide-ranging orbit like that, the moon is more likely to kick it out. But it would be cool if they found a second asteroid moon of the Earth, but thus far, none has ever been found. There's, there's been, there's been theoretical discoveries even before the dawn of the space age, where people had thought they had found uh, satellites of the moon or second moons of the Earth, but they've never turned out to be anything substantial. Yeah, I actually did a video on this, and there's a, there's an article on this that I did that sort of covers that, and all of the objects that are kind of moony and sort of moony, but none of there's, them are actually... There's moony. one called, I think it's pronounced Corinthi, and it's in a horseshoe orbit. Cruinia. 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 Yeah, it's it's, it's Welsh, in, I think. It's a, it's a pseudo-moon, and Venus has a few of these, too, that I've written about. It's a quasi-moon of the Earth. It's not actually orbiting the Earth in a traditional sense, but it's in a resonance, an Earth-crossing resonance with the Earth. And some are in horseshoe orbits, too, where they, they approach the Earth from behind... And then they kind of lag behind, and they start moving around, and then it's uh, it's kind of a complex. Unless you see the actual graphic of a horseshoe orbit, it makes no sense. The first time I had written about it, I'm like, I don't quite understand this. Till, till you actually see one in motion of how it works, like, I get it now. <laughs> Does that mean there's space ponies if there's horseshoe orbits? You never know. I think there's space ponies. <laughs> there should be. Uh, so before we move on to the next story, Nicole would love there to be space ponies. Pony lords, jump for your lives. Okay, um, <laughs> there is... Uh, Amy did a little research here and dug up a piece of information here, so let's just go back to it here. Oh, water on Mars? Yeah, come on, hold on, yeah. there it is. Yay. Um, yes, so I, I did find the reference... Um, for every cubic foot, which is 0 0.03 cubic meters of Martian soil, you can get two pints of water. I'm sorry to say, you were beat. <laughs> you, were, you were beat to that by Will Eyed Oney. Uh, oh, <laughs> my came up before you. Oh no, oh, it really? came up first on mine. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it was pretty. <laughs> but thank you, Will, for I saw his. But, but that's. I mean, that's a lot. Finding the same yeah. reference online. <laughs> I mean, you could get out there and shovel for a couple of minutes and dig up a bucket of yeah, of regolith like and yeah. yeah, and then stick it on your Martian stove and heat it up, and the and a couple of pints of water will percolate out the bottom. Well, then, is it yeah. potable? I mean, how much energy is needed to make it potable? Well, isn't it perchlorite? Isn't it coming out of perchlorite, which is poisonous, right? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, that's. I guess that's the next step of whether or not. Yeah, it's you have to get into the economics of it. Able. And then you would have to distill life. it, and then you. Yeah. Right. We need to send the von yeah. Neumann well, we out of it. Martian moonshine right. next. Of course, Martian of moonshine. course. Once it's exposed to the um, once it's exposed to the Martian atmosphere, wouldn't it just kind of like boil away instantly? Yeah. Anyway? Right. So you yeah. gotta like leave. You're just gonna stick your straw you down into the soil. Well, I just right imagine. The you know, catch as much as you can. <laughs> I'm just imagining it like you know, like people are on these Arctic expeditions and they have this little stove and they grab chunks of ice and they heat it up and then that's their water and they they make their tea from it. So it's gonna be the same thing except the Martian. Explorers going to go outside. They're going to dig up a bunch of perchlorate. Yeah, they're going to dig up a bunch of dirt. You can put in there. There's yeah. little tablets you can put in to make it, you know, <laughs> right. collect well, some I, of the crap. But, like yeah. iodine tablets or whatever. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Iodine yeah. tablets. Thank you. Crystal light. You got to mix it with some crystal light. Get rid of that nasty Martian flavor. <laughs> they, they need to design a straw. You, filter. Can put, you can put dirt in one end and water will come up the other. Mission <laughs> Mars, sponsored by Brita. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, oh, I think when I I think we're doing a show here. Uh, let me see. No, <laughs> this is the uh, show. This is it's the show. This is what people come for. Yeah, they want our nonsense. Today. Yeah, uh, you know what? Let's uh, let's raise the level of professionalism. Let's go to the most professional person oh. on the entire team, oh. and that, of course, is oh. Doctor Nicole what? Gallucci, me? the only I... one here with a PhD. <laughs> with uh, a pink pony. That fares <laughs> well for all of us. <laughs> 
<laughs> so raise raise our standards, well, Nicole, and talk first, about the uh, the Cat's Paw Nebula and the the new Apex instrument. I will, but first we got a comment from Hugo Burnham asking, "How much water would you get from a cubic foot of Earth's regolith in comparison?" So somebody look that up <laughs> while I do this story. All right. Because <laughs> I'm curious as well. Um, and I guess it depends on where yeah, you are. I, yeah, that would depend when, because you get it from a if fog. You're, like in the Sahara, or if you're like yeah in Florida. Because we have an atmosphere. <laughs> okay, so, but we're going to talk about uh, submillimeter uh, telescope, so this is the really high end of the radio telescope spectrum. Uh, this is APEX, the Atacama Pathfinder Experiment. It is a single-dish telescope uh, out in the Atacama Desert at 16,700 feet, so it's it's at that site where I, you know, uh, went and visited, and there's not a lot of oxygen up there, and you get really dumb. But you have to be <laughs> you have to be smart enough to do the astronomy. And uh, they were testing in a new uh, instrument called Artemis. And Artemis is um, actually a bolometer array, so it's more like a you know CCD that you would have on the back of an optical telescope, and that it has many many pixels. Uh, and so it is it is a better imaging instrument than you would get for uh, you when you normally think of having a single dish radio telescope. So this bolometer array on the back end uh, was used to image the Cat's Paw Nebula. Uh, oh, good, you're showing it. Sweet. That saves me. That saves me extra work. Um, and so this gorgeous image here is uh, showing the orange, which is uh, the um, emission picked up by the cat by Artemis by Apex. Um, uh, it is put on with a visible image, and uh, the visible light image you have all these dark patches, and those dark patches uh, you can't see through unless you go to the submillimeter, and this is the uh, light that lets you see through these dust clouds to the, the cores of, of forming stars. This is a, a star forming region um, and so we can actually map how these young stars are forming. So this was uh, like I said, just the, the first image, it was just kind of a test, it wasn't um, I think a big science study that came out of it but it looks like it's, it's, it's like flames, it's, it's really cool. Uh, so, so this is um, the bolometer array called Artemis on the back end of Apex and so they're looking forward to doing really great submillimeter science uh, once this is fully commissioned and fully, or I guess it's fully commissioned now once it's uh, fully running. Now I did hear that they're going to be sending the, um, the Artemis is going to be going back for some more um, calibrations and then before it actually uh, comes uh, okay. comes back and gets assembled onto Apex permanently. Okay, so it is. So still this is a, so imagine that. I mean, this is this is gorgeous. <laughs> and this is a test image. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Uh, now, have you actually seen this instrument or this this observatory? Up no, close? I only saw. I think I saw it from the bus on the way when we were up at, at the site, the Alma site. I didn't actually get the chance to see it. So, is that so, a picture? That's yeah, that's the instrument itself. On the back yeah. End. Very cool. Yeah. So I don't know nearly as much about bolometers as I wish I did, but uh, I know that they're really, really fascinating uh, instruments. And so this is, uh, you know, two K pixel camera basically being used on a radio telescope. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, qu a few quick stories. Uh, there was a Soyuz launch this week. David. Yeah, there was uh, the next expedition went up to the ISS that went off uh, Wednesday, I believe it was, and it was a fast track launch too. That one went out of Baikonur, and it was a four orbit, six hour rendezvous with the ISS. Those are becoming more common, but it's uh, I think it was you, Jason, that said that it actually took the families. I saw you on Twitter saying it took the families longer to get back to Moscow yeah. from Baikonur or the capital there in Kazakhstan mm -hmm. to, than it did for the astronauts to get up to the ISS. So, Which is why they stay there uh, until the astronauts arrive and they, they dock and you know open yeah. the doors and everything instead of going back to Moscow. I didn't watch the docking live, unfortunately. It was a little past my bedtime. But uh, the uh, the booster still is going to be re-entering. I'm tracking that on, uh, on space track right now, too. Booster should be re-entering here in 24 hours. The Soyuz... Uh, booster that actually put them up there is still in the general orbit of the ISS right now. So usually that comes down within a few days. But they're going to be up there until, I believe, March uh, when they're going to do the next swap out. And uh, this this actual Soyuz is going to be doing uh, duty as a, as a lifeboat up there. I think they're going to swap it around from the it docked on the Poist, Poist module of the ISS, but they're going to actually swap it over here pretty soon. And uh, we're actually, yeah, I'm going to try an experiment here. I hate, I hate to, to do this. I'm going to try something. This, I'm sure this is going to wreck it, the whole hangout, but here we go. 
the uh, the Cygnus module will be docking too. That's still up there. They waved it off uh, for a technical problem a few days ago. Yeah, they're gonna that's going to dock Saturday, right? Tomorrow. That's going to that's going they're going to try to dock. I believe it is tomorrow. So it's a busy time up there at the ISS right now. Once they they had the problem with the software issue on the Cygnus, they were waved off until they could get this scheduled Soyuz launch up there and docked. And now they're they're the next thing in the pipeline going to the ISS. Oh, cool. So you have a busy time up there. Uh, at the beginning of November, there's going to be um, nine crew members aboard the uh, I saw space that. station. Yeah, they're going to be, there's going to be uh, an overlap there. There will be nine crew members aboard, uh, and there will also be, for a brief period of time, a Winter Olympic torch. Uh, I saw that too. Space station. Yeah, yeah so they're really they're awesome. gonna you know it's gonna spend some time up I, in orbit before the um, before the uh, uh, expedition uh, comes you know comes down like, and they get ready for thirty seven thirty eight. And it gets it's the, the world cool. record for the high jump. <laughs> oh, very cool. I, I like watching these Soyuz. I like watching these Soyuz launches because you can actually wa- get the in cabin view like through the entire time when they're going up. Unlike the shuttle launches where they you don't get that in cabin view. I think it's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And they always go on time. I've never watched all these Soyuz launches I've watched. I've never saw one where they've been delayed for anything. They always they always go on time. Regardless watched, of weather, it can be We watched one a in a blizzard. snowstorm. There was one in a snowstorm one time they launched. Yeah. yeah. It was like that's pretty amazing. You could barely see the pad and and yeah. there it is. It took off, you know. Yeah. That's really cool. I would love to watch one of those live. It's it seems like it's so like if you've ever been to NASA Kennedy Space Center, it's there's like big crowds and it's there's like well lawn chairs set watch, up and it's a very I don't know, if it's you, very if you go to a launch event. At, if you if you go to a launch at KSC, if you're at the press site or if you're at the causeway, you you're still about three to five miles away. Mm-hmm. You watch these ones from Baikonur, we see we see trucks driving around Seconds before the launch, up by the pad. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, it's just you know, business as usual. They're moving around, doing. Th- oh, and there's a rocket launch. Oh yeah, yeah. we're just going to space. <laughs> just going to space. <laughs> Pull up another train. Get another rocket on the, uh, on the pad. Yeah, it's it would be quite something. I agree, Amy. We all need to go to Moscow and then to Kazakhstan. Field trip. Road trip. Field trip. Let's go. Road trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are the roads don't like in worry Kazakhstan? About armadillos or right, frogs man. or anything like that. <laughs> we need to make sure we have dash cams on all of them, just in case yes, there is yes. another asteroid or another uh, asteroid coming in. Indeed. Um, okay, Amy, uh, Spitzer is going to have a new job. Yes. Um, so over the last few months, of, as we've all been quite sad, that Kepler has sort of passed on to its non-planet hunting life because it's lost its ability to focus, there is a new player in the exoplanet hunting game, and that is Spitzer. Um, NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope is one of the the four... Uh, what is the formal thing called? Uh, Sorry, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> um, it's part of with, with Hubble and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and I forget the name of the other one. Um, it's designed to look at the universe in four different wavelengths, and Spitzer looks at the universe in infrared light. Um, and it's been doing that for about ten years, which is pretty good, because it was only ever designed to last for a year and a half, and it's, it's mission was extended to five and it's still going. Um, and this has a lot to do with some really clever engineering by the team. They sort of built in backup ways to um, to cool this, the, the telescope and its instruments. It's cryogenically, it's got cryogenic cooling. It's it's very weird and I don't totally understand how it works. Um, but they've, they've been able to actually repurpose some of its instruments to make it a really good exoplanet hunter. So the, the the key in exoplanet hunting is of course being able to look very precisely and not very you know steadily at a distant point of light at a star and look for these sort of dips in light as a planet passes around it. Um, so what what this team behind Spitzer has done is actually repurpose one of its it's not its its primary camera but its secondary camera that it, it used to um, pinpoint and figure out where to point the primary camera in its previous life. Um, they've repurposed that and taken the data from that much more um, it's, it's a much more sensitive camera and then feed that data into its infrared instruments which means that now Spitzer can not only look for exoplanets it can look for exoplanets in the infrared light and this is interesting because everything emits infrared radiation including exoplanets so 
Spitzer's in, in, bleh, excuse me. Spitzer's instruments allow it to actually look at the composition of exoplanets, and as they go around the side of their star, uh, the telescope can actually gain some information on the world's overall temperature. So it's it's a pretty interesting um, our piece of piece of equipment in our arsenal against you know finding exoplanets. Until the gyroscopes go. Until, until yeah, until <laughs> something else goes on this. But hopefully it'll, I mean, it's done really well. It's way outlived its primary lifetime, so hopefully it'll last maybe until James Webb gets up there. Maybe yeah. not. Probably yeah, Spitzer's, not. But Spitzer's been let's, great. Let's, yeah. let's hope that it so. actually... I think yeah. James Webb is 2017, I think it's 2018. The 2018. Yeah. It keeps sliding back. It keeps Ish. slipping, doesn't yeah. it? Ish. Ish. Now, before we uh, before we wrap things up, I want to share uh, an image that we posted on Universe Today today, and it is it is unbelievable. So has well, that's not it. That's not the image. That's turtles all the way down. Hold on. Um, you are down in the hangout. You're in the hangout. You have been. The hangout. All right, here we Hello. go. So this is the size comparison of science fiction spaceships. <laughs> and it's hard to get a sense, and I, I hope you've all got this turned to the high-def version of your, uh, of your, of your uh, Hangouts, because this is in YouTube, because this is unbelievable. So I'm going to zoom in a bit here. I see Darth Vader's Star Destroyer. Yeah, so what do we got, right? We got, there's a Super Star Destroyer. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen the, the Battlestar. The Executor. The Executor. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, we've got stuff from Warhammer, from the Warhammer Forty Thousand world. Is that the Death Star be... at the bottom? Uh, I think so. Yes. There, there's um, there's got to be a Battle Star on there, but I don't see them. Uh, there's from Lex. Do you guys ever see Lex? I think it was a Canadian thing. <laughs> yes. Oh, I've seen Lex. Yeah. <laughs> that so, show was hilarious. So weird. Stuff from stuff, stuff from. Let me see what else we got. Stuff oh, from wait, uh, Wing the Commander. Stargate. Look! 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 There's the Stargate. Did All the Stargate there? ships. Yeah, What's the the, big... um, the motherships, the gold motherships. Yep, stuff from Robotech. Oh, there... What's the big flying tree? Big flying tree. It's a, like it's right up there. It's bigger than the Star Destroyer. Is it? Wait, yeah, a that... flying tree? It look it looks like one there. Like oh, on its side. Okay, on its I was side. Gonna say, that's not right the one there. from Saga. I don't know what it is. Is it? Is... No. Is the Yamato in Eve? there from is that the... Oh, Eve. That's the yeah. That's the yeah. big one. That's is that the Erebus class Titan from Eve? Maybe. Oh, cool. I played no, the brown one. one under it, I think. The brown one under it looks like a tree. Yeah. I don't know. I think that I'll have is... i scroll around that now. Serenity yeah. is not on there. What? I, I, think it would I know be it's like sad. A, it would be like a pixel. I mean, it, they could... Well, there's some oh, yeah, stuff in the very top corner here that we can check out here. Hold on. Or at least right. according... I haven't been through it all, but according to my boyfriend, Serenity is not on there. Oh, really? <laughs> there's a lot of stuff from EVE Online, which... Uh... That could be a great poster. Oh, look, there's a there's a Valen ship. I didn't yeah. see anything from, <laughs> Is that from Babylon Five. Five. Is that the Babylon Five one? Yeah. I'm, I'm... Sweet. Where's yeah. Spaceman Spiff's cruiser? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sure. So if you haven't already, uh, dig, just dig through that and just just feel all the sci-fi nostalgia as you look through these uh, these images. It's just terrific. Wonderful. Okay. Well, now is the time when we start to wrap this show up. But before we do, I want to give everyone a chance to shamelessly promote things that they're working on. So uh, uh, let's start with you, Amy. Now, we've already shamelessly promoted your Buran article, but anything else that's happening? And where can we find out more Amy Shear title? Uh, sorry, your your audio went all wacky there. Are you telling Did me it? to promote things? Yes, yeah, promote things. Um, I'm not working on anything super exciting right now. I don't think. Um, go read my Baron article because I'm really happy about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, and but people can find you. Do oh, I have to yeah, do this for also. you? People can find you at uh, <laughs> AST Vintage uh, Space on Google Plus and your blog Vintage Space. Yeah, you also yeah. blog for I forget. Anyway, uh, move on. Yeah. Everywhere. You had your chance. Go to my okay. website. Go to just Google. Any blog for the it. internet? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Just check the internet. You might be able to find it. Do people uh, still blog? Is that a still a thing? It's still a thing. Oh, Ciro Villa made a good point. He just put Fermi. I don't know whether he was talking about the uh, whether some of the NASA spaceships are any real spaceships on this. No, uh... that was before that image. Oh, he was talking was... about right. Okay. Oh, okay, the, yeah, that's yeah. the fourth. That's the fourth observatory. I think it was Compton. Compton yeah. Gamma Ray Observatory. Which is that, Fermi. that's been that's. I think Compton and Fermi are different. I think. I'm not certain, but oh my yeah. God. My high my high energy friends are gonna kill me. <laughs> 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 Compton's been because Compton, Compton yeah, was deorbited. 
Yeah, the great the great observatories were Chandra, Spitzer, Fermi, and no, Chandra, Spitzer, Hubble. Guys, there's an internet. For Hubble this. and Hubble, Compton, Compton. Chandra, Com- and Spitzer, Com- not yeah. Fermi. Compton, not Compton Fermi, was yeah. the or- Compton yeah. was the orbited in 2002, though it's not up there anymore. Yeah, yeah but it was yeah. one of the great observatories. Yeah. Uh, David, where do we find out more? Uh, see, this week I was active on Astro Guys on my site, Universe Today, Listasaur, Canada.com, and I will be doing an in-person star party for my next event tomorrow night at Starkey Park. So if you're in Pasco County or on Tampa Bay, come on out. It's free. I've been there. It's a good time. Yeah, yeah. That's the first place I ever met Jason, as a matter of fact. Nice. I it's tweeted that out. And, oh, cool! I'll be over. I was like, I was like, you're in the area. It's like, no way. Even better than hanging out online is hanging out in real life. Meet space. IRL. IRL. We can watch. We well, can watch so space jump pass over in person. Oh, that's great. Uh, Jason Major, where do we find out more? I'm at lightsinthedark.com. I'm also writing at Universe Today uh, and Discovery Space News, and you can find me on Twitter at JP Major. Um, also, a little public service announcement. Uh, I, over the past few weeks, I've been having a hard time with my uh, with my MacBook Air. Turns out I had a bad battery. Um, it slowed down like <laughs> crazy. So, uh, so I, I, I found out that you're not supposed to fix them yourself, but you can fix them yourself. <laughs> so I ordered the parts, um, figured out how to replace the battery, which ended up being really easy as long as you have the right tools. So I put a little uh, how-to up on lightsinthedark.com. So if anyone else is having the same problem that I was, where their their MacBook was just you know running s- slow as anything, uh, you might need a new battery. So go run over there, uh, lightsinthedark.com, and check out my how-to and you know where you can find the pieces for that. I think I need to follow that how-to. In fact, I had a little warning come up on my MacBook Air saying that my uh, my battery was having problems. So yeah, it, you know what? They they don't. You know, the law of entropy hits them hard, and and they don't live forever. So um, you know. And I also left mine plugged in a lot, and that's also not good for your battery to just you know keep running it plugged in. So uh, yeah, you get a new one, and let me tell you, it, it just basically night and day. You know, it's working great now. That's awesome. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, no uh, Doctor Nicole Gallucci. Where do we find out more? <laughs> I, what would you like I, uh, to shamelessly promote? Uh, all the things. I work at CosmoQuest, so come do citizen science with us. We, uh, I just sent out a newsletter blurb with the current state of all our projects, so we are still looking for people to map the surfaces of Vesta and Mercury and even the Moon, even though our first oh, paper is cool. coming out on that really soon. Uh, and then I am at noisyastronomer.com. You can get to all my other blog stuff that I do from there. So I blog for Skeptic and Discovery Space and uh, School of out, so yeah, come say hi. And people will be able to say hi to you in person shortly. That's what, well, people can say hi to me all, anytime they, if you want to come to Southern Illinois and hang out. I, <laughs> I also do in, in person star parties every other week, so come on down. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to be at Geek Girl Con uh, October 19th and 20th, I think. Uh, the schedule just got posted, so I'm doing an edible astronomy panel and I'm doing a careers in science panel. And I'm a part of uh, of uh, Dr. Rubidium's Do-It-Yourself Science Zone, so we're still raising money to get that completed. Uh, I'll post a link in the, in the comments, but if you search DIY Science Zone Geek Girl Con, you will get one of our posts where we beg you for money. Uh, and then in uh, October, the weekend before that, October 12th and 13th, I'm going to be in Boulder. Phil Plate, Marcella Setter are doing the Boulder Science Festival, and so I'm uh, making comets <laughs> out of dry ice. and. In a safe manner. <laughs> so it'll be a good time. So come say hi. That'd be great. Yeah. Scott. More Scott. Where? More Scott. Um, I'm at knowthecosmos.com. On Twitter, I am Bold Astronomer. I am also doing all the things. Let's see. I do Space Fan News, which will be coming out either later tonight or early Saturday morning with Tony Darnell at Deep Astronomy. Also working with the Hubble Space Telescope team with their Hubble Hangouts. And the virtual star parties, this thing that happens on Sundays with, with some, some people. Um, so where we connect a bunch of telescopes up and look at the universe in a Google Plus Hangout. So Fraser and I co-host that, and we take over the inter- interwebs. Now that uh, Breaking Bad and Dexter and everything like that is gone, we can... We have uh, one more it. night. No, we got one more night. One we're more night. Con- we're going to conflict with Breaking Bad one last time. DVR it. We're live. You can always watch. the story's not going to change with those. Trust me. And and I want to give one quick thank you, which is that the uh, YouTube channel that you're watching right now just crossed the 10,000 subscriber Woo! mark. Woo! So Yay. so thank you everyone who has subscribed to this channel. We're it's doing great something to see. right. We're doing some. It's they, great they to like see it. that you all love space 
and uh, and we really appreciate it. And so, hey, thank so, you for your kind and sincere comments and yes. your wonderful support. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and you and you you improve YouTube greatly. So, we really appreciate it. All right. So, but if you haven't already, you can subscribe and then make it eleven thousand. Uh, so, thanks everyone for watching, and we will see you all on uh, on Sunday night for the virtual star party. If because you're going to skip Breaking Bad. Yeah, skip Breaking Bad. <laughs> Go watch the VSP. All right. Thanks everyone.